tumors uh, creeping up from the grad students that, that all we do is uh, human geographers only tell stories. And uh, at first I was a little bit, um, you know, discouraged by this and was somewhat self-reflective. And then having talked to Cynthia about it, she convinced me that, well, yes, we tell stories, we tell damn good stories. And if you don't have a story to tell, then, then what's the point? And so, you know, I thought about it and I took it to heart. And as, as Jane said, I've done uh, work in land change science and much of it's quite quantitative. Uh, but then I've, uh, I won't say I've abandoned that, but more recently I've, I've been trying to integrate different modes of expression. And so today I, I will in fact tell a story. And uh, let's see, where do I go from there? It says, the, the title of my talk, Apocalyptic Species, is taken <clears throat> quite explicitly from a book written by Craig Childs entitled Apocalyptic Planet, Field Guide to the Future of the Earth. And it's a book that I use in my class on environmental catastrophes and, and tipping points uh, to get across a viewpoint that some people will tell us that the Anthropocene isn't such a bad thing. And you really look at the geological record because, well, a lot of bad things have happened. We've had uh, collisions with asteroids, forced through subduction, there are tectonic shifts and plates and continental drift, all kinds of stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I take issue with that perspective personally. And today, uh, the talk is going to be in some respects a meditation on what Karl Marx referred to as species being, our species being as Homo sapiens. And in particular, uh, my concern with what, what I regard as our attack or perhaps our war on nature, I put nature in quotes there, uh, by way of apology to critical theorists, I don't think you have to worry too much about that in this class. Uh, I am going to posit what would be condemned as a nature culture binary. Uh, now, because I'm going to lament the loss of nature, and in particular, uh, the loss, uh, the, the lamentation that began with the Romantic poets in England, Jane, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, Wordsworth. Uh, many of them writing in the early part of the 1800s with the onset of industrial capitalism. And, you know, that onset was not a very pretty sight. And many people date that as the beginning of, of the Anthropocene. So, um, and in, in essence, what, I, what I've tried to do in this particular essay, I don't know if I achieve it or not, is to, is to recapture a vision by Samuel Taylor Coleridge in what's probably his most famous poem, uh, Kubla Khan. And there's a quote there. It's a quote that I lead off with in the essay. I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice. And so the idea is to achieve this uh, epiphany, if you will, uh, through the text itself. Now that's a, that's a big job. And as I say, I don't know that I have achieved it, but that's the effort. Now the background to the talk today is a trip that Cynthia and I made to Patagonia this past January. And uh, by the way, all the photos in here are photos that we took. Uh, I didn't want to go, actually. I just thought, you know, who wants to go to Patagonia? It's really cold. Uh, you know, I've seen everything there is to see in Amazonia. You know, who, who really cares? Um, so that's partly the background of, of the talk today. There's some other elements of background that I, I didn't get time to, to put into a slide. But I'll, I'll go ahead and just mention, mention them. Um, in, in the talk, in the essay, there'll be reference to a lot of things that you probably won't be familiar with. Certain species of, of uh, trees and plants, for example, uh, that you would observe in certain parts of, well, the Southern Cone, but also in, in Amazonia, and certain peoples as well. And in particular, one people that uh, a pre-Incan civilization in Chavin de Huantar which is on the eastern slopes of the Andes in, in Peru. And these people uh, actually orchestrated a cultural exchange and trade between Amazonian peoples of way back in time and the coastal peoples as well. And one thing they're noted for is they dug caves into the Andes mountains, ran water through the, the caves to produce, and I don't know how they did it, but sounds, which they then uh, turned into a type of deeply watery and fluted music, which they use in conjunction with hallucinogenic plants uh, to actually terrorize the people who visited their, uh, their place and convince them to pay tribute. But they will figure in, in the 
talk today. And uh, I don't know if this one will work right here. Now, a, a couple of elements, and these would be lost on you. Does anybody here know David Nuiwa by, no, by, by any chance? Uh, David Nuiwa was the great nose writer, surfboard nose writer of all time. Uh, and he was quite famous uh, before the shortboard revolution, which came in the late 60s. And so he figures in here, and I guess this is when I need speed still to bring up that other, well, maybe it works here. Yeah, I won't play the whole thing. But this is David Nuiwa, hanging Ken, which you know, Okay, now there's something else that's important, which is the next slide. Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah. Well. Okay. Cream. Yeah, you'd be familiar. Yeah. Right in cream. Uh, there's a song that figures very importantly in, in my essay. It's called World of Pain. It was by the Cream. It was on their second album, Disraeli Gears. Oh my gosh, where'd it go? I think I really messed up this time. One more help, <laughs> and then I'll be done. I think then I'll be done. I'm trying to get back to that. I wanted to play a little bit of the song. There, okay. So this is it. That's enough. Just a reference in the in the essay. So now I will return to the essay itself. And I suppose there's there's one more thing. So the way the essay is structured, uh, we have to get, we're going to Torres del Pain. Uh, it's a very famous group of mountains. It's a massif in southern Patagonia. And to get there, you have to go across a lake. And my essay starts with a journey across this lake and uh, catabatic, a catabatic gale was blowing with winds that are about 50 or 60 miles an hour. It was terrifying. We thought the boat was going to sink. And I actually had the, the foresight to, to record it. And you can see what it was like. background and we will get serious now no we were too frightened okay so there we go Lake Pehoe Cindy and I boarded the catamaran sitting near the bow where steel holes joined beneath a deck of plexiglass we were on our way to the trail for Torre Still Pain Chile a 20 minute boat ride away the wind was blowing, and as we got underway, tornadoes of spray seemed to boil off the surface of the lake. Our vessel took it in stride, or at least it seemed to, riding the swell with the ticklish up and down of a roller coaster. Then, boom, came the smack of something heavy, smacking water. Our engines quit. We drifted before the tempest, listening to starboard, as waves washed over the deck above. Were we going down? And if so, can we make it to shore through the frigid water? Cynthia nudged me and drew my attention from morbid thoughts to a pristine morning in the pain massif, chiseled by diamond sunlight and a sky of baby blue. It seemed the immediate expression of raw molten power in the vertical ascent of its jagged peaks, the toothy gaps and valleys cut by pounding streams. When I first saw them upon arrival, this outrageous collection of geologic forms, otherwise known as mountains, I couldn't help but imagine they were about to fall over or blast away, or simply vanish as a figment of my imagination. Mr. and Mrs. U.S., beautiful, isn't it? It was our guide, Marcello, a tall man with a thin face whose gaucho cap had known better days. 
He'd taken the calling of this after I told our group, a Brazilian couple, two Colombian sisters, an Argentinian guy, and two U.S. citizens, a joke, a Brazilian joke about a gaucho and a caiman in the swamps of the Pantanal. So, Manya, do you know that joke? No, it's a terrible joke. Okay. <laughs> Evidently, he heard it before and was not flattered. I spent years on Brazil's Trans Amazon Highway in the company of agronomists, not well schooled in social niceties. I bore their cultural imprint. Yes, it's amazing, I said, hoping he'd linger for conversation. But after two days, he was still irritated with me. Upon checking to see we were okay, he returned to where he'd been sitting, stern. Okay. Toy is still pain. So this is, we get it. Across the lake, we survive and we start up the mountain. After stowing our gear in already pitched tents, we headed for the trail, which paralleled, which paralleled the Ascension River. Two hours later and 3,000 feet higher, I stopped to catch my breath and looked back through the gigantic V of the valley. Lake Payaway gleamed in the distance, an aqua colored swatch amidst gently rolling tableland. Here on the trail, I stood circled by a stone hinge of rocky spires and sunlight burning with bronze intensity through a yellow blue sky. I grabbed my camera from my backpack and started taking photos, but soon heard shouts barely audible in the wind. Come on, Cynthia calling from down the trail. I put my camera away and hurried off. Our group had disappeared in a green wall of forest slanting down what was now a fully revealed mountainside. We reached it in 15 minutes and another 15 minutes found the meeting lunch in a grove of old growth Southern beech trees. It was a lonesome spot with scattered deadfalls, some of it heaped on legs of desiccated wood and skeletal jumbles like bones, a prehistoric beast that had died in their tracks. In places rose bushy trees with balls of false mistletoe whose yellow green foliage stood on end as if electrically charged. Rip Van Winkle beards of moss sagged from the branches, giving the place a weird sense of supernatural habitation. Marcelo informed us we'd become burdensome, although he expressed this politely. As I really wasn't that committed to the trip, I volunteered to remain behind. Cynthia said she'd stay with me, but I refused because I knew how important it was for her to reach the Torres. So off they all went. Several took advantage of my decision to hang back and left their extra weight with me. Once I found a place to put the group's odds and ends, I sat down back against a beech tree. Gems of sunlight filtered through the canopy to flicker on the forest floor where entanglements of tiny roots stitched the ground into a mat that was spongy to the touch. I barely closed my eyes when they twitched open. It took a moment to remember where I was. My watch said 4 p.m. I dozed for an hour. I stood to stretch, noticing that the trail to the Torres crossed an opening in the forest just a few yards distant. A dry arroyo ran down the middle for 100 yards before disappearing into the empty foreground of a distant mountain set beneath the dull blue wash of the sky. It had to be the valley. I grabbed my camera, crossed the trail into the opening, and followed the arroyo. In a moment, the downslope of the terrain yawned sharply as the mountain I walked on dropped away beside a granite ledge papered with viridian colored lichens. A thousand feet below, the Ascension River ripped furiously through boulders that the arroyo had dropped and that the mountains had thrown down at it. Only the faintest gurgle echoed, echoed in the deep canyon. The wind had weakened, so I stepped onto the ledge and sat in a semicircular overhang that offered an unobstructed view of the valley, on the other side of which was a mocha-colored wall of granite. It sloped with the convexity that a Japanese watercolor might have depicted as a cresting wave about to break. Streams sprinkled down its narrow gorges and silvery threads to disappear in a forest crawling up its slopes. To the left rose a higher mountain crowned with a pinnacle that looked like a crumpled witch's cap. Beneath it, erosion had scarified the rocky surface into crenellated battlements, replicating the dorsal spine of a stegosaurus. This intricate and precisely scaled rendition seemed impregnated with a mineral antiquity, with a psychic incantation that beckoned to a past that had vanished from time. As I studied the valley, a paranormal sensation possessed me with the suspicion that were I to blink, everything would be different when next I looked. The shapes of the mountains, the color of the sky, the plants, everything. I sensed the presence of another world ready to slide into view at the slightest provocation, heralding a, his heralding a history that had nothing to do with me, giving us erasure of all humankind into molecular plasma. Although I knew this wouldn't happen, my suspicion had a basis in fact that the panorama before me concealed events at odds with the tranquility of the afternoon. I could almost hear the explosions 
as they rip the quiet landscape into particles of dust, imbuing all its notable features with the ghosts of a fiery creation. After all, this has been a battleground where planetary forces shaped the world, the scene of an ancient drama unfolding in geologic time. By my good fortune, I'd arrive in a period of quiescence between scenes of shattering violence. What comes next, I wonder, absorbed by the pleasant serendipity of having occupied the list to kill time, only to discover myself a witness to the pyrotechnic romance that was the creation of South America. Yet, although witness to such a dramatic happenstance, I had no role to play, and for this felt strangely bereft. The human contribution to the story was this, nothing. A melancholy, a melancholy took hold of me, steeped in nostalgia for a time that had never been mine to begin with. I watched all of it, the world I knew, and the cataclysmic one I just imagined spin away to the neck of a shrinking bottle to the far edge of space, then beyond. My purview was limited, and the most obvious engagements denied me. I couldn't skip across the valley for another view of Lake Peoe. I couldn't mount the witch's cap and breathe the rarefied summit air. I couldn't launch myself from the highest point and fly. It dawned on me then. My melancholy of the moment was the same one I'd experienced in coming to understand I'd never accomplished my most fervent childhood dream to fly. Not by ultralight or being set Boeing 767, but by my own exertions in the body with, with which I'd been born. Unfortunately, I'd been condemned to terrestrial habitation bound by gravity with the body too dense to levitate. The blink of a shadow swished by almost close enough to touch. Condor, I cried out, startled by this bold apparition. My spontaneous impression, unfiltered by logic, was that a mountain god in Apu had sent this magnificent creature as compensation for my earthbound imprisonment. Nevertheless, the coincidental, na coincidental nature of my sighting bothered me to the point Lady Florence Dick Dixie, the first European tourist to visit Torres del Paine in 1878, and who dubbed them the Needles of Cleopatra, had seen a condor too, and on the same trail as described in her book, Across Patagonia, published two years later. This fixed the Patagonian wilds with a durable literary trope that anyone could steal to adorn their writing about the Southern Cone. I wondered if the condor might be a sympathetic hallucination born of fatigue, altitude, and desire, a hypnagogic fantasy induced by the somnambulance of a Proustian afternoon. Yet I was seeing it, which filled me with a visceral delight, inconsistent with the mild corporeal reaction I might have had following a seductive dating. My familiar was a male by the comb on its beak, which looked like a French sailor's cap pushed jauntily forward. This is not a creature for bird bass in the garden. As the condor glided down the valley with predatory confidence, I grabbed my camera and took photos until he disappeared. My familiar wouldn't have any trouble riding thermals to the tip of Tierra del Fuego. How I longed to follow him through sun dappled gorges, I could only imagine. On setting my camera down, I brushed what felt like a worn brello pad, and for an instant thought I'd unknowingly sat on the back of a sleeping animal. Mesmerized by the timeless immobility of the setting, I half expected for the beast to rise and re reveal itself on Mylodon, the giant land sloth whose remains Darwin discovered in 1832 on the second voyage of HMS Beagle, commanded by Robert Fitzroy. Now extinct, the beast was certainly known to the aboriginals of the Pleistocene Ice Age. It was therefore dis dis disappointing to discover that the fur I touched was not the revival of an exciting past, but a matting of lichen so thick, it felt like someone had lost count putting down coats of acrylic paint. Luckily, my mystic artist had garnished the ledges blue-green monotony with swaths of orange moss and nickel-sized clumps of dirty gold algae. In 15 minutes, it was close to the time I might expect the group's return. So I grabbed my camera and stood, brushing the crumbly lichen dandruffs off my pants. Scanning the valley, I was relieved to see the giant bird returning. I wondered if it harbored any atavistic recollections of the ice ages his tribe had endured, of the volcanic upheavals and violent subductions. The ordinary catastrophes of an apocalyptic planet had nearly wiped the condor out on more than one occasion. A refugee from the continent where it once abounded, abounded at least the condor still ruled in Patagonia. The bird passed before me. 
It drifted through the opal translucence of late afternoon along a wall of granite, now aglow as if dusted by saffron glitter. High over everything, the jagged symbol of the witch cap spire etched a cryptic message to the vastness of the southern latitudes. When next I looked, my familiar had disappeared heading north. As I turned for the arroyo, it occurred to me a condor could glide the front face of the Andes to Venezuela. A condor could find the mountain passes in Ecuador and Peru and ride the winds across the spine of the continent to the convective thermals of the Amazon basin. I wondered if a trail existed that went the distance. Could I track him all the way if I wanted? <clears throat> past the meadows of the bryophytes, their orange and red stems woven into spectral placemats for the roaming mountain boulders, past the giant redwoods of the Alersi forest and the monkey puzzle trees with their candelabra crowns, through the mountain passes of the Cordillera Blanca, past the Kenwa trees and their papery sheaths of orange bark, the puya plants with their purple spires atop petal globes, the McGay cacti entangled in glossy tentacles. Did the trail, if it existed, continue east as far as the condor might fly, through the gorges of the fern forests and theaters of bamboo by the misty waterfalls, through the lush orchid valleys of the Aguarico, the Upayali, the Marañón, the Napo, to the confluence of the Solimois in Rio Negro and the lair of Cobraganji, known as Amazonia, to where the flowering trees, Itejosha and Amarillo, Castaño du Pará, and buttress giants, Sumauma, shaded the hedges of wild banana and vines of maracujá, beside the swamps of the acai and bodichi palms, the roosts of the macaws above the ceaselessly running water. In other words, what I wanted to know was if a pathway existed connecting Patagonia and Amazonia through all things luxuriously fecund and breathtaking. On reaching the trail to the Torres, I felt pricked by the sensation of being launched. Turning quickly, to catch whoever it was in the act, I found myself facing a granitic monolith that for some reason I hadn't noticed on the hike down the arroyo to the valley. Reminiscent of the stone carvings on Easter Island, it folds at midsection with a maw that seemed to be laughing at me. An assortment of boulders lay scattered about the grass in a vague concentric pattern. This geological assembly did not have the feel of an accidental arrangement. To the contrary, the atmosphere was that of an aftermath following purposeful acts of destruction by beings more powerful than I. Had Titans built something, a couple perhaps, only to turn around and destroy it? In fact, the Tehuelchi could very well have passed this way, the giants that Magellan's chronicler, Antonio Pigafetta, reported in his law to be twice the size of the average Spaniard, looking for gold, spices, and slaves. Had the Tehuelchi built a temple and smashed it to pieces, disillusioned with their gods, for having to flee the steel weapons of the European savages? What other mysteries did the landscape hold? What secrets would never be told? I buffered the ambient soundscape to immerse myself in a quiet solipsism that economized on my sensory exertions. Thus, the distant noises I began to hear across the threshold of decibels I deliberately chosen to neglect and notified me of the imminent arrival of my fellow hikers returning from Torres del Pain. On materializing from the shadows, they moved like medieval penitents, hoping to wash their sins away and avoid the Black Plague. But the guttural sounds they made, so far no more intelligible than the bark of a dog, together with their bipedality, suggested another interpretation, especially since their trekking garments added heft to their silhouettes. To the point, their bulky shadows gave my fellow hikers a simian air, suggestive of the bridge in evolution leaking homo sapiens with our close genetic relatives among the higher apes that Darwin thought he'd stumbled upon when encountering the Fuegian people for the first time. Yet it soon became clear that these ambulant creatures were human. I knew this the instant that the back and forth of their utterances indica indicated the play of real language. Our group were united. We returned to camp and deep mountain slumber. Okay, so the next day is Gray Glacier. Okay. I think maybe it doesn't seem to want to advance. Oh, there it goes. Trail the Galay Glacier. Okay. Thank you. Just your presence. I woke sore in my sleeping bag. 
already addressed, Cynthia said, we've got 15 minutes left for breakfast. I'm not going. What? Who cares about glaciers anyway? It's just ice. You're such an Amazon snob. I deflected the comment. Nobody likes me there. Why do you tell that Brazilian joke? Let me Strauss put a Brazilian joke in Christi Throw Peaks, I said defensively. I hope you don't have it written down in English anywhere. How was I supposed to know he was a gaucho? Instead of responding, Cynthia left. As this was our last day in the mountains, I reached for my notebook, feeling the need to jot down a few impressions. My mind drew a blank though, so I called it quits, got up and dressed, then headed for breakfast. The glacier was only a half day hike anyway. I might as well go. Anxious about my reception, I searched out our group in the crowded dining area, but everyone was happy to see me. It turns out by hanging back and letting people leave their extra weight behind, Mar um, people were happy that I'd hung back and let them leave their extra weight behind. Marcelo asked, Roberto, how many blondes it takes to screw light bulb? Cynthia was blonde and I was too or had been, so I played along. I don't know how many, five, one to do job, four to mix drinks. In good spirits, in good spirits, we headed for Gray Glacier by crossing a meadow of undulating grasses and pagodas of purple lupins nodding in the breeze. Beyond the meadow, we began a gradual ascent through a craggy valley. The morning sun behind us like a chrome disc in a silver sky. It wasn't long before the teething of the trail drained away our gay breakfast spirits. This was work. In an hour, we reached the pass where rocky walls closed from both sides. They funneled us up a narrow pass through a cemetery of trees. The bleached remains of a forest, a forest that had burned three years before, thanks to careless campers. Now the landscape collapsed to a barren terrain of rock and gravel, where an occasional shrub jittered in the wind. To the east, a mountain shot straight up to neck craning elevations, then levitated to a high stone fort made by twin spires, between which lay a tongue of ice tinged lime green on its downward edge. An intricate whimsy of cirrus floated over everything like panes of filigree sliding across the luminous sky. The geology began to alternate between narrow ravines and stone terraces with views in all directions leading to a rim of far off mountains. In deep gaps where the wind died stood microforests of Southern beech trees. Low stature from the climate and exposure, their girthy trunks bore the markings of age with thick reams of fissured bark. The woven nets of foliage shaded tiny meadows that glistened in the mucks formed by seepage bubbling from wet rocks. After 15 minutes resting on Mossy Lodge in one such refuge, we resumed our trek to the glacier. We'd been on the trail for two hours, during which time the wind had gained considerable strength. On the trail again, we walked with our shoulders stooped like Mongolian merchants in a Tibetan blizzard. I stopped to tighten the straps on my backpack and became aware of a sound that penetrated the howling of the wind. It was subdued and vibratory, possibly seismic. Worried by this, I studied the immediate environs. My eyes came to rest on a lone beech tree growing from the stones 20 feet off the trail, its scraggly crown dancing in wind-driven hula hoops to the hypersonic thrumming of its leaves. It was the tree. On watching the beech's Sabbath dance, I imagined what would have happened if in an alternate reality, I'd, plot, I'd, have, plopped, I'd have plopped earth near where the tree stood, a motherless infant without a home. The wind would have seized me, dribbled me here and there, a soft pink basketball at the mercy of the hostile elements. With luck, I'd have been mistaken for a baby beast and gathered up by a female mylodon to be nursed on her ample breast, protected from whatever predator might have come for me. Most likely, vultures would have arrived in minutes to peck my eyes out. There was no denying that the lonely beach was a survivor. I remembered a song, okay, here's the song, uh, that impressed me as a surfer whose psychedelic empathy included feelings such as those I was now experiencing. Before she shot and killed him in a jealous rage, Gail Collins and her husband, Felix Papalardi, had penned a tune for the cream on their second album, Disraeli Gears. The, the lyrics of World of Pain rushed in my brain as if to compensate the oxygen the wind now sucked from my lungs. Outside my window is a tree. No time for pity for the tree or me. Is there a reason for today? No time for pity for a growing tree. My appreciation of this song, still intact after all these years, was based on a misunderstanding of the first line, which for a long time I thought to be rendered as, outside my window, he's a tree. Later in life, I wondered if Heidegger would have written Being in Time had he come from South America. 
Had he been raised a speaker of Spanish or Portuguese, he'd have internalized the rules for using the verbs for be, namely ser and estar. Consequently, he'd have known that to be has precise meanings in particular contexts, and therefore a multiplicity of explicit definitions. As such, it didn't require a great mind to excavate his protean meanings because they've been sketched out a priori. Although I didn't read Heidegger until long after the cream exited the pop scene, I did what he probably would have done had he, had he been a smoker of marijuana with the surfer's predisposition to the inventive use of language at the limit of grammatical convention. I suspect that he, like me, would have found it difficult as many did to understand what the cream were singing, given the extent to which electrical guitars drown out voices in much of their work. Don't forget, this was Eric Clapton's catapult to the high wire competition with Jimi Hendrix and Tim Fick <laughs> for being the best guitar player of all time, at least as the Rolling Stones saw it. Consequently, Heidegger would have had no choice but to interpret the lyric according to his own preconceived view of the world and guess as to the cream's intentions. One strong pull on the bong would have provided him with the same uplifting inspiration that led me to the permissive rendering that added a pronoun he to the lyric. My bet is that Heidegger would have dispensed with the straitjacketing use of is as a mere locational reference. In retrospect, what's odd to me is that once I knew the correct phrasing, I preferred to remember the song the wrong way. Why? I'm not exactly sure. It could have been the atmosphere of the time, the psychedelic sense that the world isn't a landfill of inert substances dumped into predetermined labels, but rather an efflorescence of interacting signs redolent with joyful meaning. Alternatively, my stubborn misremembrance may have simply been, I didn't feel like recalibrating downward, my very high estimation of the band. After all, it was I who made the mistake. As I gazed at the beach being thrashed by the ferocious wind, I realized that my misunderstanding had given the song philosophical content I'd never fully appreciated before. In particular, because I traced from the tree into an active subject, it no longer need be seen as something merely decorative that good fortune had placed outside the songwriter's window to be pitied as they pitied themselves. Rather, the tree in the song, any tree for that matter, possessed sentient being, with apologies for the gendered nature of my original formulation the lyric, with all the rights of existence thus vested. The biological implication followed. Trees were equal partners in creation. Mirror entities sent out a different evolutionary pathway than mine one that had given them great powers of resistance. Despite my admiration, it saddened me to know that my botanical sibling had been abandoned on the side of a heartless Patagonian mountain. Its true home was Antarctica. Same with the others back in the ravine. They were all members of an ancient tribe that rose in the late Cretaceous before the cataclysm of plate tectonics set them drifting with the continents, a diaspora of evolutionary orphans. Like the condor, the southern beach had been torn from its native land by an apocalyptic planet, made a refugee with no home. Kicking through loose gravel, I stepped from the trail and started for the tree. I'm not sure why. Only that I was responding to an inner prompting I couldn't resist. I suppose I wanted to stand beside it as, as if doing so might show my empathy and admiration or prove in some way that I understood, even though I could not have said what it was I understood. But halfway to the tree, I stopped as a contrary thought emerged. My actions presumed a beneficent sentience on the tree's part, which made sense from an animistic perspective, although unrealistic from my empirical experience of the world. But even if the tree was conscious of my approach, there was no guarantee it would welcome me and acknowledge my empathetic intentions. Just because I thought we were mutually sympathetic co-inhabitants of the same planet did not make it so. The sad fact being, I wasn't like the tree or the condor. For one thing, my species was of a more recent origin. Yes, we'd been orphaned on occasion, forced to cross continents to survive. Yes, we'd suffered earthquakes and landslides, predation and starvation, but we were different in a fundamental way. Unlike the condor and southern beach, we mostly fled from disasters of our own making as refugees from what we deliberately destroyed. The condor and southern beach will probably soon cease to exist because of us. There was no escaping who we were, the apocalyptic species. What are you doing? I turned to see Cynthia waving at me. I waved back, then hustled to catch up with her. Together, we followed the rest, strung out in a single file fighting the wind. 
We came to a terrace overlooking Great Lake where clumps of blue ice floated on milk green water. We walked the ridge line that paralleled it. The temperature dropped. The glacier was closed. Our group pushed on, stretched out along the ridge, Cynthia and me behind the rest. I knew we neared the glacier when shouts of excitement rang out. The ridge cur curved abruptly, then slipped down and up in such a way that all at once we were there, pinioned before it on a windy knoll. We walked to a nearby pallet of raised rock and hopped onto its flat surface for a better view. It took a moment for the collage in front of us to clarify into its component parts. Gray Glacier seemed to slide from the top of the world through caves of ice to a valley cradled by dark mountains. It had its own atmosphere, its own silver light, part reflection from freezing vapor, part refraction from thawing mist. In places, blocks of ice form low escarpments and the surface looked rippled. Sooty crevices paralleled the rocky shore. Directly before me, the waters of the lake lapped the glacial boundary, a ragged jaw of blue ice. The wind roared and everything was still. I looked up the glacier to a river of frozen snow mantling the valley. There, on an aqueous horizon beneath a dome of flurries, a crystal beacon flashed the message calling for me to come, for this was the path of the condor, the one I sought to follow, its rum line spooling to the peaks and valleys beyond the glaciers, its diamond signposts marking the way. From the blue dominion of space, the jagged spine of a continent, from the southern ice cap to the Cordillera Blanca, from the snowy speaks of Huascaran wrapped in glaciers, brilliant in the flaxen light, to the eastern slopes of the Andes and Chavin de Huantara, whose shamans conceived this world as one and shaped the mountains into flutes of water, to play the Apu songs and send the flowers forth, to mix the snowmelt with the rains of Amazonia and perfect the continent with its crown of ice. I could see it clearly the path before me to all rem that remained of the world we'd soon destroy, to my paltry recompense before the creator. I dropped to my knees. As the wind enveloped me, I lifted my arms to its buffeting salutation, to its cruel neutrality, for why I was a, for I was a condemned man upon the sacrificial stone, incorrigible, apocalyptic. I shivered, but wasn't cold. Will my blood be worthy? The time had come. Cynthia touched my shoulder. What's wrong? Nothing. I managed to wipe a tear away with no one noticing, then stood. Everyone was looking at the glacier anyway. So what do you think of glaciers now, she asked. I don't know exactly, I said. I'll tell you the next time we come. That's it. We can ask questions about it. <laughs> We tried to go down immediately afterwards, yeah. but we couldn't get a flight. Why didn't you want to go? Why did she have to twist your arm? Uh, I, I had no idea. You know, uh, maybe I was just lazy. I, I like going to tropical islands. <laughs> we, we had a trip planned to go dive with the great white sharks, uh, Guadalupe Island, but then they canceled it. So we went. <laughs> Are you glad you went? Yeah, it's really, I, I highly recommend it. I highly yeah. recommend it. It's worth seeing. Has anybody been there in the group? No. We well, should go there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should go to the Amazon because it's going to disappear. Like probably, it can be hard to see original parts of it within 20 years, I think. So you should go like book your flights later today. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you, so this is very much out of my kind of realm, um, Earth, and so I'm wondering, like, when you go on these trips, do you have an idea that you all, like, think of it this way, or when you're walking, does it come to you as you get there, of how you're interpreting things when you're walking? Uh, I, well, I always carry notebooks, I make extensive notes, impressions, mostly just sensible impressions of what I'm seeing, and then the, you know, the layering of interpretation typically comes later because usually you're too tired when you're traveling, you know, it can be pretty grueling, especially this trip. It was really, really rough. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in the climate health world, there's this sort of tension between people talking about something called the climate apocalypse and people talking about 
solutions and thinking of resilience mm -hmm. adaptation. But at the end of your thoughts that you shared, you sound like you're condemning people slightly. The way you talk about us as an apocalyptic species. I condemn I them uh, massively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my question yeah. is, is the solution then complete combination and demolition of this apocalyptic species? Would that be a solution or would that be sad because we wouldn't be there to conserve nature anymore in your view? Well, you know, it, it's kind of tough being, you know, it's, um, if you're a criminal, a member of a gang and, you know, you've been socialized that way, how do you get out of it? Um, I mean, I always thought that there could be, I, I should, I'm getting old, okay? And I think there's a life cycle thing. I think the older you get, the more pessimistic you get. And I just, so you asked me if I, I, I uh, support just bombing human civilization to, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer it. I mean, you know, I really don't. I think that we're just screwed up as a species. And I just, I think that, you know, we, we could all sit here and agree on something without too much trouble and probably get along fine. But then when you start massing people together and, you know, you, you put 330 million people in one nation such as the US and you kind of set loose populist politics and everything else that comes with that and then you just becomes very chaotic. I don't know how you get out of that. I mean I think uh, you know adaptation has always come after catastrophe for the most part. I mean it'd be great if we could sit down and, and very and, and you know we we would not we, we could actually solve these problems I think if we sat down there's the technology the capital, it's all there. What's not there is kind of the the willingness to agree. And uh, and I think that's been pretty routine through human history. And I think what happens is there'll be just a, a massive catastrophe. And then finally people, it's like a war. Why, why do wars end? Well, people just get so exhausted, they can't fight anymore. And then they spend at least the next 50 to 100 years trying to avoid war until perhaps they forget, forget it. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just don't know what to say. Uh, there will be a, a climate apocalypse, but you know, it's probably not going to be sufficient to really get people excited because you know there's enough capital to build seawalls. Uh, people have enough wealth, at least those who have the money, to move and escape harm's way. And uh, you know, it's not like a it's not like a, an asteroid strike, for example. It's it's a much more gradual disaster that doesn't have that kind of catastrophic effect. So I don't know that I call it a climate apocalypse, uh, but it's a climate disaster that's in slow and in a slow unfolding. Yeah. Just having heard this before, mm -hmm. there's another interpretation. It's almost as though Patagonia became what it is without humans. That it's going to continue when the apocalyptic species is gone. Because of like the, the mountains, the everything is just so, you know, unhuman, basically. Mm -hmm. So the positive side is yes, the apocalyptic species may species may disappear, but Patagonia may re its ice and we will be there. So I basically just gave another version of a child's argument for apocalyptic planet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you could take humans back in time and pre industrialization, pre modernization, uh -huh. or maybe they actually pre agricultural industrial okay, and keep them there, would you still call them your actual species? And also, do all disagreements have to turn to one? <laughs> I mean, technology really left the, the, the genie out of the, the box, really. I mean, I mean, there's, there's an anarchist school of thought, which is, is called primitivism. And the, the argument is that, that we, uh, I mean, I think it's silly, really, but honey, honey, and the only way to really organize this society peacefully is with hunting and gathering. I mean, I just, I think it, it's easy to poke holes into that. But I mean, if you go back honestly and look at those, those societies, they're, they're pretty brutal. I mean, they typically have seasons of starvation, uh, you know, infanticide, uh, they were just pretty rough. But, well, that's true. That, I mean, that's absolutely true. They just didn't have the reach to do it. 
And they have, I mean, those people who have spent time among indigenous people will know that there's a different sense of community and uh, social wholeness among indigenous people. I mean, it's, it's, it's different. Um, and so perhaps, and maybe, you know, if we had indigenous organizations, uh, maybe in nuclear weapons, maybe they wouldn't use them, for example. I don't know. These are nice, interesting speculative questions. Yeah. I guess my question was really similar, but um, you apologize in the beginning for the, uh, the, the dichotomy between uh, nature and, and people, noting that like a lot of critical theorists might think, uh, might characterize it differently. Um, it's like, well, what would it look like if it was, if, it, if you were thinking about more of like a, a spectrum of human coexistence with nature? With so nature? Like kind of an, an either or. Like Gainesville about 20 years ago, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So told, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, look like in what way? I mean, uh, what kind of social organization or? Well, in, in terms of the relationship with nature, I guess. So kind of like what Audrey was asking, but okay. uh, you, you were focusing on um, yeah. the potential conflict between humans and humans. Okay. Like, that's why we can't coexist with nature. Okay. Like, is there like a coexistence with nature? You know, we have one? It? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. I mean, there are a lot of people who, who could do that, you know, and, and I think... Then you start getting into, into, you know, what is the social system that's driving people, the incentives that people have to exploit and exhaust their resources. Uh, yeah, so the answer is yes. I think that uh, you can have a, a peaceful coexistence with nature. Uh, the difficulty is, and I, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people in, well, in the U.S. in particular, I'm very sensitive to this working in South America because Americans are always kind of, pointing to wherever, Brazil or Peru, and look at how those people, they don't know how to manage their resources and look how great we do, you know. Look at Florida, it's a disaster. I mean, there's no more old growth cypress <clears throat> anywhere. They're very, it's very hard to find natural bodies of water. Uh, the sand dunes are being built on. I mean, it's just incredible. The Lyco could show these eutrophic. Uh, why is that? Well, I mean, it, 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 well, they're, I say incentives driving people to do it. I think it's mostly, uh, you know, landowners who have been profiting off land markets here for about a century or so. Uh, if people will buy land and if they can find it, they'll buy it, they'll drain it. I mean, it, it's just incredible. They'll, I mean, the big thing, I mean, the thing that's just amazing is they decided, well, we love these uh, exotic pets up to a point, but if the python gets too big, we better you know, take it out to the Everglades and dump it or lionfish or whatever. I mean, you know, so, I mean, the, you know, most of the, all the natural systems have been destroyed in Florida. There's no more staghorn coral. There's no more real corn coral. There are very few reef fish. It's mostly lionfish. There are hardly any turtle grasses in the grass flats and, you know, in the coastal estuaries in the South. So, I mean, I guess I'm getting on a soapbox here, but Yes, people could do it. And actually, there were a lot of people who wanted to do it right, uh, say, 30 or 40 years ago. They changed a lot of laws. Actually, they had growth management in the state. Uh, there were controls on uh, wetlands conversion. Uh, there were a lot of regulations. That, and they were just, you know, I don't know what happened. Uh, Cynthia and I left the state for 50 years. And when we came back, it was almost different. It was legislative assault on, on the environment. So. What's that? Thousand people day before that. Right. Yeah. I mean, a part of it is population, but you know, it need not be. Uh, 20, 21 million people in the state. I mean, you don't have to. Everybody doesn't have to have you know two acres of land. They could have built up, but not out. But you know, it's all history now. So Florida sucks. <laughs> and on that cheerful note, <laughs> watch out for the police on your way out. <laughs> Fitting ending, really. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bob. Yeah. To you. <laughs> I promise to give a positive talk next time.